Okay, so it's a great pleasure uh, to have Raffaele Ferrari from MIT uh, today in our seminar series. Um, uh, and uh, Raffaele will not talk today about clim the climate modeling uh, alliance, uh, the CLIMA, but uh, we'll talk about heat transport and the scaling theory in planetary atmospheres uh, and oceans. And um, for the format, I'd like to say that questions are encouraged also during the talk. So if you can uh, type them into the chat and then I will, uh, I will moderate the, uh, the questions. So uh, please, Raffaele. Um, Okay, thank you. And yes, if you can check questions and let me know if anybody asks, because I tend to forget about checking the chat. Yes, no, I, ch I check the chat. Yes. Yeah. Great. So thank you for having me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is indeed work that I've done with Basile Gaillet uh, at Saclay. I'm Rafael Ferrari, well, virtually at MIT. I haven't been at MIT for a year now, in a year and a half at this point, nearly. Um, I think the last seminar you had was by Tapio Schneider, who is the PI of the Klima project and we are also involved at MIT. So this work is partly related to an attempt to understand turbulence in the ocean and how you parameterize it, but it's going to be more on the mathematical approach to the problem and try to understand some basic properties of uh, turbulent flows in the ocean and atmosphere. And by atmosphere, I mean, I mean uh, both Earth atmosphere, but more in general, planetary atmospheres. And what is the question that we want to tackle? I try to show it here. This is a simulation that was run in particular by Tapio Schneider, but this is a pretty typical simulation that is often run with large scale climate models. And here on the left on this color panel, by the way, do you see my mouse, the curve, the pointer or not? Yes, thank you. Oh, wonderful. So on this side, you see the initial temperature of a simulation of a three-dimensional atmosphere. It's a numerical model. It starts with a, a temperature gradient that changes only in the meridional direction. And this is the temperature profile that we have at the surface. And uh, this uh, temperature gradient is initialized to be in thermal wind balance with a velocity field. And then you let that system evolve in time. And what we're going to see is that very quickly, uh, some instability develop along those temperature gradients. And you see the formation of what we call eddies or geostrophic turbulence that tend to modify the temperature profile that we started for, from. Actually it tends to reduce the temperature difference between the pole, this is latitude, between the pole and the equator. And what we want to see is whether we can come up with some scaling law or some simple theory to explain at which rate the turbulence transport heat between low to high latitudes in a pretty generic framework. This is not a problem that arises only in the atmosphere. The second example is from the ocean, in particular the Southern Ocean. George will be familiar with the, the um, Australian continent, which I think is what you see to the right in this figure. And again, this is now a numerical simulation of the ocean itself, and it's a patch of high resolution. You're looking again at surface temperature in the ocean, and you start seeing again the formation of a lot of these turbulences, these geostrophic eddies. On top of it, if you look in the simulation, on top of having these eddies, these nearly circular patterns, you do have some kind of stripiness that you see here. These are what we're going to see in a second are jet-like. The second figure is the, from the same simulation we've seen before, but now you're looking at velocity instead of temperature. You see that there are features that look a bit like jets and then they break into vortices. So we see the two characteristics of these systems or of turbulence uh, on, uh, rotating stratified flows, stratified means that the temperature changes, tend to have this characteristic that it forms coherent eddies and jets superposed on each other. So this is the kind of tools that we want to understand. And we're going to take a pretty idealized point of view to deal with a system that is simple enough that we can probably make progress, but we're still going to address questions about the fully turbulent flow that develops out of it. So it's still a strong and nonlinear system. In particular, we're going to consider what is called the Phillips model. It's a two-layer QG model. Two-layer means that we're going to consider a fluid composed of two layers of different density, a density rho one over a density rho two, with rho one is less than rho two, so it's stably stratified. Um, and these two layers can represent two layers in the atmosphere with dense air under light air or dense water under light water. The reason why a two-layer model is a sensible approximation for the flows we want to describe in the ocean and the atmosphere is it turns out that most flows in the ocean and the atmosphere 
tend to have pretty weak vertical structure. So they tend to project on what are called low modes. And since they don't vary rapidly in the vertical, you can essentially assume that this two layer model is a projection on the two lowest model, uh, the two lowest vertical model of the system. And indeed, there are ways to actually formally prove that. Uh, so it's not an unreasonable model that to be used to describe ocean and atmospheric flow, at least to understand some of the basic properties. We're also going to assume, or we are going to consider a projection of the full Navier-Stokes equation for this two-layer flow that applies for slow motions. And by slow, I mean on time scale longer than the rotation period of the Earth. So under that limit, the flows are close to what is called geostrophic balance, meaning the, the Coriolis acceleration is balanced by pressure gradient forces. And you can do a projection of the equation and the dynamics of the system is governed by what are called uh, conservation of potential vorticity in the two layers. If you don't know what PV is, it's essentially a proxy or close to the angular momentum of the water on a veneer or water column in each layer. So what we're describing is really the conservation of angular momentum where column in the upper layer and in the lower layers. In the way we write it, psi one and psi two are the stream function in the upper layer and the lower layer. They give you the velocity. And so the angular momentum is advected in both layers. The Jacobian formulation, just the advecting term, u1 dot grad q1. And q1, for example, this potential vorticity or a proxy for angular momentum is equal to the relative vorticity, so the spin of the column around its axis. And the second term instead is a stretching term. It's the fact that these two layers are divided by an interface and in the interface can move up and down. So your air column or water column can stretch or squeeze. And so this is the second term is the stretching term as it is typically called. You have a PV in the upper layer and a PV in the lower layer. And as you see, the stream function is related to the potential vorticity. So if I know the potential vorticity, I can infer the stream function and then I can use the stream function to add back my potential vorticity and see how it changes in time. This is called an invertible problem because just by knowing Q, since Q is related to Psi, this is a closed system. I can just evolve it forward in time. Since our question in particular is to describe what I call this form of baroclinic turbulence, that turbulence associated with, as I've shown in the example of the atmosphere, with changes in temperature in the meridional direction. And that change in temperature on top of it is associated in thermal wind balance with the velocity field. So what we're going to do is that we're going to assume that there is a tilt of the interface. So this interface is tilted and the interface here is a proxy for temperature. And you can see why, because in a, in a vertically average sense, when the interface slopes upward, you have less warm water or warm air than cold one. And so it's like this system is a bit colder than the system on the left hand side. So you can think about that density surface sloping upward as associated with the temperature gradient where water here on in a vertically average sense is warmer and here it's colder. Indeed, the analogy is even more strict. You have the uh, uh, isentropic surfaces in the atmosphere or density surfaces in the ocean and they do indeed have that slope. So now we're going to assume that our interface has a mean slope north to south and that that mean slope is in balance with the thermal wind flow. So a flow that now is in the zonal direction uh, that is just therm in geostrophic balance, thermal wind balance with the density surface. So this is what I'm writing here, that we have the thermal wind balance. We prescribe that mean tilt of the interface. And then we are going to look only at perturbation, how that system that now has this tilt in the interface, and that provides some potential energy. You can think if the system was non-rotating, you'd expect that density surface to straight away slump down back to the effect of gravity. In the rotating system, we see that that system actually generates a baroclinic form of instability that generates a lot of the eddies that you've seen in the movies before. But more importantly, what you have to remember up to this point is that, that this dynamics is controlled by two external parameters. One is this shear that I prescribe by imposing an mean tilt my interface. Uh, so it's externally prescribed, and you can think about the large scale flow in the ocean of the atmosphere. And then what is called the deformation radius, which is a characteristic scale that depends on the reduced gravity. The reduced gravity is just G multiplied by the fractional difference in density between the two layers. And it depends on the rotation of the planet and the thickness of each layer. The mean thickness H, I'll assume in this talk for simplicity, the layers, the thickness of the two layers 
rest is the same. So they would just have equal thicknesses. Uh, so you really have two external parameters that you can control, the shear and the deformation radius. And the rest is just that the system will freely evolve. And for the moment, what we're going to do, we are going to solve the equations Given this mean state, we're going to solve only for the perturbation of the equations from that mean state in a doubly periodic domain. And if I do that, I get simulations like the one you see here. Here I'm plotting in particular what we call the barotropic stream function. That's the sum of the stream function in the two layer divided by two. And so you see that as soon as you let that system evolve, it didn't have any flow at perturbation flow at time t equals zero. But as soon as you let it evolve, it generates a lot of these small vortices that move around. They are pretty diluted, meaning that they are pretty widely spaced in this limit. We'll see in a second that that has a lot to do with what I do with the bottom drag we'll describe, that I'll describe in a second. Maybe I can do it now. Is that I'm showing you what are the two equations in the upper and the lower layer. In the lower layer, for to allow the system to equilibrate, we're going to put some drag. That could represent drag in the atmosphere, at the bottom of the atmosphere or at the bottom of the ocean. If the drag is very weak, you get into this dilute gas limit that you see here. If the drag is very strong, you can get a very a much more packed set of vortices, but that's not a limit that seems to be particularly relevant in the ocean or atmosphere. On the right-hand side, instead, I plot what I call the temperature. The temperature is just the inter thickness or the, the interface in the upper layer. It's the difference between the true stream function in the two layers is proportional to that. So you can think about this as being the temperature itself. Uh, well, sorry, here I should have pointed out, I'm not plotting psi, I'm actually plotting del square of psi, the vortex itself. Here instead, I'm really plotting the temperature. And you see that essentially blobs of heat, um, of warm and cold water are moved around by these vortices that stir the system. In the talk, oops, I didn't want to do that. In this talk, we are going to consider two different forms of drag. And you see in a second why I want to use two different forms. It's just to show the robustness of the scaling we are going to get. We're going to use a linear drag. So we say that the lower layer uh, has a force that is inversely directed opposite to the mean flow in the lower layer. You can actually formally show why a linear drag could be expected if you assume what is called linear ECMA dynamics in a flow that has um, a no flow boundary condition at the bottom. So you might get the drag law of this four, but if you think that the flow is not linear in the bottom boundary layer are more turbulent, maybe the theory suggests that a quadratic law is more appropriate. And so we're also going to consider a quadratic law so that you're aware of it. Kappa, we refer the coefficient kappa, we refer to a linear law, a linear drag law, while the coefficient mu will always be used to refer to the quadratic drag law. So what is it that we want to do in the talk? Well, what we really want to find is the scaling law for the meridional heat flux. And what I mean by a meridional heat flux is really V, the meridional velocity times tau the temperature. V times T is my heat flux in the north-south direction. So I want to know how effective the turbulence is as transporting heat from north to south. V here is really the DDX of psi, where this is the barotropic velocity. By definition, psi is a string function, so the psi dx gives me the meridional velocity. I'm only considering the barotropic velocity because uh, you can figure out that the other term would be a, a, the velocity associated with the meridional, uh, sorry, with the baroclinic string function, which is d tau dx. But when I take an average, this is an average over the whole, my whole domain, which is doubly periodic, where tau x times tau averages to zero. So heat is transported only by the barotropic velocity in this system. So this is my total heat transport, the transport of heat in this system. And I can write it in this form. I can say that that heat transport is equal to minus d, d tau dy. I just use a diffusive closure. It might seem to make sense to use a diffusive closure in this problem because I've shown you that I have a, a dilute gas of vortices that is moving things around a bit like in Brownian motion kind of mixing where you have a very long free path in the system. That said, here, we know that the mean temperature gradient here, the tau dy, just proportional to the shear. This is in thermal wind balance. So this is just d time u. So in this particular problem, the diffusivity is just my heat flux divided by u. So the diffusivity is just another name for the heat flux that is scaled by u. And so why do I care about this term? Well, because I want to see whether I can predict once the system becomes fully turbulent, what this 
heat transfer is just as a function of external parameter where the only external parameter here are going to be u, the shear, lambda, the deformation radius, and the drag coefficient. These are external parameters. And I should, uh, and I'm aiming to get a scaling load that just gives me what is the functional dependence on these parameters. A diffusivity just on dimensional argument uh, can be expressed as an RMS velocity times a length scale L, which is called the mixing length scale, right? I'm just saying that if I want to know at what rate I transport heat, well, it's some RMS velocity, some time, uh, sorry, what is it? The, the diffusivity is some RMS velocity time a mixing length scale. And then of course, if I multiply by d tau dy, L times d tau dy is my mean temperature perturbation, right? Uh, so what is L? This is what I'm trying to describe here. Let's assume that you start with a temperature gradient, like in the initial simulation I shown you for the atmosphere, where there was a temperature that was increasing from north to south. And these are the dash line before I turn on any turbulence. So this is warm fluid and this is cold fluid. Then there is a big barotropic eddy that stirs my temperature profile. So it pushes some temperature profile northward and some southward. Well, when it moves the temperature profile northward, it's going to create a temperature anomaly here, tau prime, which is equal to minus L d tau dy, right? If this is the mean temperature gradient and L is that mixing length scale, that is the temperature perturbation you generate. So I can define a mixing length scale as the RMS temperature. This is T squared average over the full domain square root. Remember the tau here always refers really to perturbations divided by the mean temperature gradient. So this definition is just what I use to define my mixing length scale. And instead the V velocity, well, the RMS velocity is just given by the RMS or the average over the full domain of psi squared. Uh, so this is, I'm just saying that if I not, if I can express the diffusion in terms of an RMS velocity in a mixing length scale, then I close my problem as long as I find scaling loss for V and L. And uh, in particular, you probably want to non-dimensionalize this problem. So the two external dimensional parameters we have are u and lambda. So I can non-dimensionalize the diffusivity u by u times lambda, the shear times the deformation radius. So this is going to be a non-dimensional diffusivity. And the mixing length scale, I can just renormalize by lambda, the only scale parameter that enters in this problem. So just when you see a star, it means that I'm going to refer to non-dimensional variables where u and lambda are used to non-dimensionalize. In the same way, I can non-dimensionalize kappa and nu, the linear drag coefficient and the quadratic drag coefficient, again, using lambda u appropriately. So what we want to know is how this star depends in particular on kappa star and nu star, which are external parameters and L star. So how do we go about trying to think about this problem? And uh, I told you that we're dealing with a dilute vortex gas. So it seems that a good way to describe what the important quantities that I have to characterize to uh, describe this system is that there are a number of vortices. Each vortex must be associated with some characteristic circulation gamma. That's uh, the vortice or the integral of U along each one of these vortices. They have some characteristic strength. Um, there is some going to be some characteristic intervortex distance. You see that these vortices are some distance from each other. And since the mixing rate is very small, this intervortex distance, sorry, since the drag is low, the intervortex distance is pretty large. And so we are going to want to characterize what this intervortex distance is. What is the mean velocity of these vortices they meander around in the domain? Well, since I said that gamma is the circulation of these vortices, well, the V, the RMS velocity is just gamma, but for a point vortex or for a vortex, the velocity goes as the circulation over R. And if the RMS distance or the typical characteristic distance between vortices is LIV, well, then this vortex will induce a velocity in this other vortex, which is proportional to gamma LIV. So it will add back this vortex around at this characteristic velocity. So each vortex move the other one by adbacking them. It turns out in this can season- I, in can, other, I, can I interrupt? Yeah, you? go ahead. Yes, absolutely. So you, the sizes of your vortices, they kind of call each vortex is the same. So there's no distribution of, you know, vortex strings and, and vortex sizes. Uh, is uh, how, 
like if you look at 2D turbulence, like, you know, the, the, the results by Benzie and so forth, you know, you yeah. have some kind of power law distribution. So how, what is it in, in, uh, in this system that um, prevents that distribution that you can assume constant circulation and uh, constant vortex sizes? Well, this is, we get to the cost and vortex size. The vortices have a scale which is pretty much given by the deformation radius. And I think this is something that uh, we keep discussing, but it's definitely empirically true that in this baroclinic system, when you have two layers, baroclinic instability really injects energy and form vortices at the deformation scale, which is close to the scale of the most unstable mode. Mm -hmm. That is very different from two-dimensional turbulence. If you want, we call it the barotropic problem where you have only one layer, because now you can try to force uh, the system at a particular scale. But if you, our impression is that when you force the system at a particular scale, you trickle some energy down to smaller, to larger scales. But more importantly is that as you force at that scale, you cannot easily create coherent features at that scale because forcing keeps destroying phase relationship. And that's very different in a two layer system where these vortices keep draining energy out of the big system and they seem to really be quite uh, coherent. And I think it's a very good question but it's indeed what you see here is quite different from what you would see in two dimensional turbulence where these vortices have a scale which is independent of mm. the drag coefficient that we use. It's always essentially set at that deformation radius. Mm. Okay, thank you, thanks. And it's a very good question. We'll probably come back to it at the end because indeed the argument that we put forward by the end is something that would not apply to a barotropic system. It seems that the two layer system is quite different in a number of ways. Uh, and why is it a characteristic RMS gamma? Well, we might discuss that later. Um, there is a distribution uh, of strength of vortices, but as we'll see for the scaling that we get to, it's not too important as long as we know what is the RMS gamma so as long as there is some uh, typical um, value of gamma so what scaling slope do we need given that we want to characterize this full system well the first thing that we need to characterize is what is the intervortex distance but that is actually the easiest part of the problem because you might expect that if you are a particle affected by these vortices well, you can move up to a distance equal to the intervortex distance before we bump into another vortex. So your mixing length scale is essentially the same as your intervortex distance because that's how much you can move before you feel the effect of a new vortex. So essentially your motion decorrelates and you start a new jump. So it turns out that indeed the intervortex distance scales very well with the mixing length scale. And we actually verify in the simulation and that's the case. These two parameters are not too hard to compute. So then the parameters that we need to characterize are really the mixing length scale, because that characterizes also the intervortex distance, and the RMS velocity, because if you remember, D is equal to V times L. So these are the two parameters we have to define. And once we know V, well, we can also, gamma is just V times L. So determine V or gamma is equivalent. They are related to each other. So the claim is that we need two scaling laws at this point because we only have two unknown parameters. We want to be able to determine B and L as a function of the external parameter, and then we have a closure for B. And so what are the two scaling laws? Um, before we get there, and we're going to get there in a second, but before we get there, I just want to make one point, uh, which is that uh, you have to be careful about what is the characteristic RMS velocity that is associated with the diffusivity of a transport of heat. Let's consider two vortices here. So these are two vortices of opposite strength. That doesn't matter, it just makes the illustration simpler. Now, if you are a particle that is very close to the vortex center, well, you're just going to rotate around the vortex. And as a result, you don't really affect any heat around because you just take an anomaly here. And after a while, you're back to exactly where you started from. But assume you are halfway between the two vortices, then all these two vortices push you up or actually this particle in between, if I just had a two vortex system, this is a trivial point, but would just push you northward. So if there was warmer temperature to the south and colder temperature to the north, then this particle in the center is just going to affect heat northward. In the same way, this particle on the side will affect heat, cold air southward. So it's actually particles that are, let's say, halfway between the vortices or um, 
that are far from the core of the borders that are going to drive most of the heat transport. And that might see the trivial point, but just in a second now, I want to produce the two scaling laws that I think are important. And this is a somewhat dense uh, transparency, but I think it's the most important one. Is there a question? Ralph, sorry, can I ask a uh, clarification? Yeah, Thanks. Um, so just two slides back, you had uh, V is yeah, the gamma over the intervortex distance, but we wanted V to be the meridional velocity. And this looks more like it's a speed in any direction. So do you need to worry about that distinction? Uh, well, we assume that the turbulence in terms of velocity is pretty isotropic because we are in a homogeneous system. So uh, yes, if there were reason to be believe in strong and isotropies, that would be an issue. And maybe we have to revisit as we move forward when we add the curvature, which is something I didn't mention, maybe I should have. For the moment, we don't have a planetary curvature, which creates uh, an isotropy in the velocity field. For the moment, I'm assuming that there is just a constant rotation rate. So okay. the velocity is uniform. I thought maybe it would just add a, a factor of two or something. Um, in it could. But I guess it would be a small thing for a scaling law. Uh, at yeah. most. You asked a pretty profound question because when you have beta, actually that's not true anymore because you can form zonal jets that might be much stronger. Than other than meridional velocity. So in that case, it's less clear. But in this case, yes, it doesn't make much of a difference. And up to here, these are proportionality. So yeah, factors of two not uh, being uh, an issue. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Keep asking questions, everybody. It's more fun. It's already said enough to be isolated in your home. And if you talk only to yourself, it's not much fun. So the two arguments, the first one is, uh, so what is this RMS velocity that transport heat? Well, we're going to say that, assume that you're a particle that is moving now, this is a schematic, this is the top and bottom, and this is the interface of my uh, two layer system. And there is a tilt in the interface, and there is a potential energy associated with the tilt, meaning that if I take the tilt and I flatten it out, that's the amount of potential energy that the system is allowed to release. And it turns out that that potential energy over a length scale L, which is my mixing length scale, is U over lambda times L. It doesn't matter what it is, but this is its explicit form. But what I'm saying is that if you're a particle that is moving, let's say, between your two vortices, a distance L, because that's your mixing length scale, how much you do in a jump, but that particle is going to gain kinetic energy in proportion to the amount of potential energy that it has been released during that path. It's a bit like in convection, where you let the particle fall down to gravity, well, it's going to gain kinetic energy in proportion to the potential energy that it lost by falling down to gravity. Here, instead, it's just mostly horizontal, but it's just your interface is tilting. So this gives me a relationship between V, the RMS velocity, and the mixing length scale by just saying that the characteristic velocity of that particle must be proportional to the available potential energy that has been released in that jump. And this is already telling us, for example, that since the diffusivity is V times L. Well, since V is proportional to L, this also means that D is proportional to L squared in this particular problem. Um, I think this is an argument that has been used a number of times in baroclinic instability arguments or baroclinic turbulence arguments. The one that is quite different is the one below, which I think is the new contribution here of this work. Um, here we are going to write the kinetic energy budget of the system. And what that means is that if you want to know what is the overall balance of energy in the system is that you're releasing some available potential energy at some rate given by this du squared at lambda squared. Now this is the rate of potential energy you're releasing, it's just the heat flux times the potential energy in the system, right? At how at what rate you take energy out of the system. It's different from this quantity that instead was the amount of potential energy of that distance. It's an energy. This is an energy rate. So the amount of energy I extract from the system per unit time must be equal to the energy I dissipate through drag at the bottom of my system. Right? The two have to be in equilibrium at some point if the turbulence is to equilibrate. Now, it's how you estimate these terms that is crucial. This was really an insight of uh, Basil Gaillet, the collaborator. So if you think about estimating u squared average over your whole domain, well, we said that the velocity is 
like in point borders, this is just your gamma over r, right? That's the velocity field. So if I integrate the velocity squared, it's gamma squared over r squared times two pi r, d, two pi r dr, and I integrate from the edge of the vortex, which we said is lambda, all the way to the intervortex distance, because I want to take an integral for every vortex around itself, right? If I take that integral, uh, I get something which is proportional. That integral is equal to b squared times log of l star. L star is just l over lambda. Uh, where does the v star comes from? Well, you remember the gamma square over l square is v star. So I just replace the v star. But now what is very important, you see that the RMS u squared is not v squared of the, I should be careful, the integral of u squared over my uh, circular domain around the vortex is not equal to v squared. It's larger than that because it's multiplied by log of L over lambda, that's a number larger than one because we said that this is a spa, it's dilute gas of vortices. So the intervortex distance is always much larger than the size of a vortex. And L star is really the ratio of the mixing length to the size of a vortex. So why is that number greater than one? Well, because it turns out that most of the dissipation is happening very close to the core of the vortex, right? Because that's where the velocity is largest and the friction is proportional to the velocity itself. But Instead, v squared is the characteristic velocity away from a vortex, because when you're very close to a vortex, you're just rotating around the vortex, you don't dissipate energy. So there is a difference in this system between what is the total energy dissipated, which is dominated by velocity very close to the vortex, and what is transporting heat, which instead is particles that are far from the vortex because they don't rotate just around the vortex. Um, Indeed, we can also compute u cube because then again, the balance between the energy extracted by an instability has to be equal to energy dissipated by friction or by the drag. And if I use a nonlinear law, then I get a u cube here. If it's a linear law, it's a u squared. So I can also compute the u cube. I again do the same integral as above, but now, oops, I use the u cube. So what is that? u cube law. And then I get that u cube is proportional to v the third power times L star, which is again larger than the cube, just that the proportionality is different. But again, all these moments will tend to be a bit larger than what they would have been uh, if I just use the classical scaling they're using a lot of two dimensional turbulence where you said that u square is proportional to v square on this u cube is proportional to v cube. But these two quantities are really different. So now we have the elements that we need to come up with a scaling law because we know that V is proportional. This is the energy argument that relates V and L. And then we want to get the diffusivity, which is just proportional to L times V. And now, or if you want, this is already telling me that V goes L as L squared, because V goes as L. But now I'm going to write for the linear drag. If I go back to this relationship, I'm just going to plug this expression in this equation here. And so I get, this nonlinear law, then I substitute for d l times v, and for v u over lambda l, I do my algebra, and what I get is that the log of the mixing length scale goes as one over kappa star, or if you want, l star goes the exponents of one over kappa star, which is the linear drag coefficient. So it suggests that the mixing length is a very strong function of uh, this uh, mixing coefficient. In the same way, well, now we know that this goes as L squared, so also D should go as one over this kappa star. If we had a quadratic drag, it's just that this relationship changes because the right hand side is the same, but now when I compute my dissipation rate, it has a different load dependence V cube again. I substitute these two loads in here and I get the L star goes as one over the square root of mu star. Or if you want, D star goes as one over mu star. Now, it turns out that this, especially the law for the linear drag coefficient, is very non-trivial, but had been already observed empirically with no explanation by Thompson and Young in 2007. And also the scaling for the diffusivity uh, in terms for a quadratic drag law had been reported by Chang and Held, again, without a clear explanation. Actually, there had been an earlier explanation by Held that predicted the wrong scaling law. So it suggests that probably there has been evidence already of these two scaling law arising in this system, but without um, an MP or a theoretical explanation for the case. But again, we went back and did 
run a number of now fully turbulent solution of the two layer quasi geostrophic equations. Uh, especially Basil is very happy to say that, or proud to tell that this simulation will run on GPUs. So they are very fast. But uh, what is important here is that first I'm plotting this L star, the mixing length scale as a function of, let's start with the blue line is the linear drag coefficient. Uh, the blue line is the prediction from uh, our theory and the dots are the results from the numerical simulation where we really compute the mixing length scale that I said is just defined as the RMS temperature in the food domain divided by the mean temperature gradient, which is prescribed. Uh, there is one coefficient that we have to fit. You see, actually there are two coefficients, C1 and C2, that we have to fit in our expression because those are not predicted by the theory. So we're going to fit those two parameters. And then we see that the exponential growth rate, which is what was pointed out by Thompson and Young, they were very surprised that uh, your mixing that scale would increase so rapidly as a function of, um, or as kappa star decreased. Uh, the red line is instead is the prediction for the quadratic drag law. And again, the squares are the result of the numerical simulation for various values of the drag law. And you see that again, the scaling works pretty well, not when you get close to a new star of order one, this is when the friction becomes uh, strong in leading order. And we said that then you don't have a dilute gas anymore in this limit. So you would expect the scaling law at some point to fail. Uh, the prediction doesn't work only for the uh, mixing length scale, but also for the diffusivity. In this case, now the diffusivity is estimated independently. We still use the same coefficient that we fit for L star, and it still works very well in predicting the dependence of the diffusivity itself on the drag coefficient at the ocean bottom. So that's very good. We start getting a sense that probably the scaling law are pretty robust, but now we want to try to use them if we believe that we have a system, well, we believe that we have a closure that works to predict the properties of the turbulence in this homogeneous box. George? So before you continue on this, just um, so that I, uh, I get it right, um, what you've achieved so far. So you, um, you, have, you have a balance between dissipation at the bottom and the baroclinic instability, the pumping of the baroclinic instability. And at the yeah. beginning of the talk, you said that um, a weak drag corresponds to a more dilute gas, vortex gas. So, and I, I try to find an intuition for this, but it's actually the result of that your L star is de increasing with the, um, with the mu or the kappa uh, decreasing. Um, but, but we are in, moving, so as I decrease the drag coefficient, L star is increasing. That's right. So, yeah. and, and that means you have a more dilute gas, right? Because you can also yes. interpret this as the vortex size getting smaller. So is, is that so that it's not, actually, not the vortex size, right? It's the separation between vortices that is getting larger. The vortices yes, have all sorry, the sorry, same yes, size. Yes, yes, okay. sorry. Yeah. So it is actually non-trivial um, that we have weak drag um, uh, implying a dilute, more dilute gas. Or am um, I missing something? So that, that that's an outcome of your scaling theory rather than some uh, some simple physical uh, intuition. Is that correct? I think so, even though you might expect that when the drag coefficient is very large, you form vortices through the instability pretty much everywhere in the domain, and those are directly done to wherever they are formed through friction. So you might expect the system to be more uh, homogeneous in its statistics. So instead of dilute vortex is a very non-homogeneous system in some sense. So. But yeah, that is a bit end wavy. It's not a formal proof. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But that, that's basically the outcome of the scaling theory corroborates. I mean, it's in line with that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So now, what we want, if this scaling law just predicted properties of the turbulence in a homogeneous system, I would like to use it or to validate the scaling law by. Solving now a new set of equations, instead the two layer QG model, but now we are forcing it with a heat flux. So we're starting getting closer to what an atmosphere might be. We are imposing a heat flux that warm high latitudes and cools lower latitudes. The other way around, it warms lower latitudes and cool higher latitudes. So it creates 
a temperature gradient. So this is our heat flux here, it has to have opposite sign because it's, you remember that the temperature is the equation for the temperature is the difference between these two equations essentially. So you, I'm forcing the baroclinic mode, not the barotropic mode. I'm forcing the interface to tilt by putting this forcing. And so this represents a heating by some, it could be, radiation from the sun in the ocean, it could be some wind that is trying to tilt the isopaque nulls in some planets like Jupiter, it could be a geothermal heating. Uh, so now we have this system and we want to see whether we can use our scaling law to predict what is the final temperature, zonally average in Y, at which uh, the system equilibrates. And so what we can do is that we can take now the difference between these two equations and zonally average. It turns out if you do that and you ignore drag and uh, hyper viscosity that you need just to equilibrate the system, it's a very second order term. It doesn't really matter all that much. But you get that your heat flux is balanced by the meridional temperature gradient. That has to be the case. I'm cooling and heating and the system in order to achieve equilibrium must transport heat from the region where I heat to where I cool. And so this is the divergence of my heat flux, which is what I had the closure for this V tau, right? And so I can rewrite my V tau as diffusivity times the temperature gradient, which now is not prescribed because it has to come out from the theory. And actually our scaling laws tells us that we know how the diffusivity depends on the temperature gradient on lambda and cap or mu, depending on what drag coefficient you use, right? Remember that D star in the way I wrote before was really d divided by u times lambda. So there was a dependence on u and lambda in dimensional form. So right. So if I have used my scaling law, I can just plug it back in here. And now I can solve this, this is just an algebraic, well, not algebraic, but it's just a nonlinear equation that I have solution because it just depends on, it just the only unknown here is the temperature gradient of the other parameters are given, and I can actually solve for it. And in particular, I can get analytical solution. It doesn't matter what the analytical solution is, but you can solve that equation exactly. And so now I can run my system here. It's my two-dimensional, um, sorry, it's my two-layer uh, QG system, force with warming to the south and cooling to the north. We are taking the forcing acting on a very large scale, much larger than the deformation radius of the intervortex distance. So it's on a planetary scale. And you start seeing warm bands and cold bands, but then there is all this turbulence, the paroclinic turbulence that start transporting heat north and south. And analytically, we can predict what is the temperature profile in this system. And this is this black line. And the blue line instead is uh, the result of the numerical simulation when I zonally average. So I take an average in this direction. And so this is the profile as a function of latitude. And you see, I can predict quite accurately uh, what well, the final temperature profile in the equilibrated system is by just knowing what is the heat flux that, uh, and the deformation uh, radius and what the rotation rate and gravity in the problem and, and the drag coefficient. So I didn't need to know anything else. I could predict already the final temperature. So this is it's an example of a successive closure that allows to predict the final equilibrated state of the system without knowing anything about the turbulence, without having to resolve any property of the turbulence. This is a result for a linear drag. Oh, yeah, I also had the movie. You just see that it's actually dynamically active. We can do the same thing for quadratic drag. And again, in this case, the profile is a bit smoother. Quadratic drag gives you smoother temperature profile. But again, the dashed line is uh, the analytical profile. And the blue line is instead uh, the numerical results. So again, they match very well against each other. Uh, yes, that, that, that's very impressive. Um, so if you were to take, you know, that the uh, um, average of u squared and average of u cubed just go with v squared and uh, v cubed rather than this kind of logarithmic or the linear correction of L star, how would that look like? Would that be very bad? There we can have a long discussion. It turns out that if you assume that the whole scaling collapses because then the two uh, relationship I've written before they become redundant. Ah. So you can't close it anymore, okay. which is indeed the problem with the well, problem. The reason why this approach doesn't uh, translate into the barotropic problem because you can't use this simple argument. Okay. 
it really depends on having these vortexes of finite side and dilute, which you don't see in barotropic turbulence. So it is telling you something, possibly. Thank you. Uh, Isaac Held hates this point. The fact that the theory can be easily reduced it seems to be a, the, the barotropic system seems to be a singular limit compared to the baroclinic. And uh, he might be right, but we don't know yet. Um, that's what we seem to be finding. Um, are there any more questions? Because otherwise now what we I want to do is to move a bit beyond now and try to show a bit what you can do for uh, a problem without curvature, so just with a constant rotation rate, but now planets have a curvature. So the rotation rate normal to the planet is changing with latitude. And that's a very important characteristic of planetary atmospheres. And we want to add that because this is a very important topic in the discussion of planetary motion and to see how the diffusivity or the heat transfer is modulated by that effect. So again, we're going to use the two-layer QG model also in that case. But now, again, this is our two-layer model. We are going to have some teeth in the interface, which is in thermal wind balance with the zonal flow, the same as before. But now the rotation rate is changing with latitude. So the component normal to the planet is stronger at some latitude and weaker at others right or if you want a lower latitude there is a smaller rotation rate and then it increases as you move to higher latitudes because of the curvature of the planet when you rewrite your equation what it means is that you're going to have an extra term in your equation because you have a planetary vorticity gradient as we call it. there is an additional gradient because there is a change in the rotation rate of your system if you run a two-layer quasi-geostrophic model we're going to go a bit faster on this part of the problem. But if you run a simulation of two-layer QG problems with this extra curvature term, beta, you get solution of this kind. This is, again, is the barotropic vorticity equation. You see a lot of your vortices. It still looks like a, a dilute vortex gas. But now you see that there is some stripiness here in the vorticity field. Indeed, if I, instead of showing vorticity, I show you the zonal velocity, now you get this band of jets they are eastward jets, western return flow. So now there are very strong jet-like features that have appeared. And that's a feature of turbulence on the beta plane, as it is called. It's a beta plane because we are not, we are still approximating the change in rotation rate on a plane a tangent to the sphere. So we're just, instead of getting, we essentially take F, the rotation rate, and we do a Taylor serial expansion, we keep the F naught, the mean term, the rotation rate at this point, and how it changes for small changes in latitude. So it's a local approximation. But that's a detail. What you see is that you have the formation of these jets, and clearly these jets are one of the prominent features of um, baroclinic turbulence on planetary atmosphere. The most obvious example is Jupiter, where you see these very strong banded structures and vortices embedded in it. So indeed, you do see in planetary atmosphere properties like this. Uh, in particular, Peter Rhines has contributed uh, some of the fundamental ideas on what we call this beta plane turbulence. So it's just the quasi geostrophic turbulence on the presence of curvature of the planet. And he pointed out that it turns out that the space in between jets scale with what is now called the Rhines scale. This is the Rhines wave number which is proportional to beta, the curvature of the plan, uh, the, the change with latitude of the rotation rate divided by the RMS velocity. And so this turns out to be a fundamental parameter. Turns out that the reason why there is this particular scale that enters in the problem is the scale at which the system start behaving more linearly, right? As soon as you allow beta in the system with this change in planetary rotation, you allow what are called the Rossby waves, waves that where the restoring force is the change in uh, planetary vorticity. So conservation of angular momentum or conservation of potential vorticity. And it turns out that a scale is comparable to the Rhine scale. You start forming Rossby waves more than vortices per se. So there is a transition in the property of the turbulence and it's at that scale that you can start forming these jets. Rossby waves tend to propagate zonally more than and not meridionally. So now, if we look at our problem, this is D star, our diffusivity, defined as before, but now for different values of the planetary vorticity gradient. So if I make a planet that has very little curvature, it's on the left side, but it means that it has a very strong curvature on the right side. So as I increase the curvature of the planet, you see the diffusivity starts dropping down. 
these are simulation for different values of the, in particular, the nonlinear drag coefficient. We could have chosen any of the other parameters, but you see there is a drop in the diffusivity as a function of an increase in beta. And you might think that that maybe is not terribly surprising because if you believe that the folklore that jets form as you increase beta, but these jets in some way might be preventing the meridional transport properties because they are vect and stripe or shear properties in the horizontal. And you definitely see that. But up to here, it seems a pretty confused picture. So one thing that we showed, uh, again with Basil, is that we can actually collapse all the data if we plot d star divided by its value for beta equals zero. So by definition, all the points on the left-hand side here, where there is no beta, are going to be equal to one. So this is the result from the previous part of the talk where we didn't consider curvature. And now I plot them as the ratio against the ratio of uh, the mixing length scale for um, in the absence of beta, so the scaling I've given you before, divided by the Rhine scale squared in particular, right? Because I'm saying, well, in the absence, it looks like there is an intervortex distance that is predicted by the previous theory. And as long as that intervortex distance is much larger, the, sorry, it's much smaller than the Rhine scale, then you would expect the equilibration to happen because of friction before you feel the effect of uh, the planetary vorticity gradient. However, when you start approaching this uh, Rhine scale, then probably you enter in a new regime where uh, the mixing length scale is not the parameter anymore, or at least the eddies or your, sorry, your uh, mean free path starts being affected by the presence of jets. And probably you're not as dependent on uh, drag coefficients anymore. And so that's why we plot it just as a function of that ratio square, which I'm writing here. Uh, I'm just really using the, uh, Rhine, the definition of the Rhine scale I've given you in the previous picture and the, the definition of L, this uh, mean free path based on the beta equals zero theory that I've given before. So I'm just plotting the ratio of those two terms. And now you see that all the points for all different drag coefficients collapse over a single line. So it seems that we found uh, the non-dimensional parameter that captures the transition from one regime to the other. This is just empirical up to this point. Now we can work a bit harder. And, uh, there is a paper that we have under review um, um, for um, what is it? The AGU advances. It's a new journal uh, by the AGU, uh, where we make the argument that. If we want to know what is the scaling in this new regime that we didn't consider before, well, what we know is that our diffusivity should depend on this parameter B. We showed that that's what collapses all the data. And we expect that we are, when we are in this uh, high beta regimes, our scaling should not depend on the uh, friction parameter because friction should become uh, irrelevant because what arrests uh, the meander of particles is not anymore drag, it's going to be this Rhine scale that I introduced before. So we can find out that in order for that to be the case, in order for the dependence on that parameter B to be independent or for the diffusivity to become independent of the drag coefficient, well, we can find what is the scaling law that we need to have for that to occur. And it turns out that, well, here I'm already writing the full solution. If I consider the scaling law in this high beta regime, well, cancel this term because that becomes subdominant. We just get that there is a dependence, a power law dependence on this beta to the minus two. So the diffusivity depends only on um, a Ryan's kind of scale, or if you want, or just on beta itself. On the curvature, while well, when you are at low values of beta, then it depends again. This is the same dependence that we had before uh, in, the, in the drag law. The fact that we sum these two, it turns out that you can think about this as uh, a simple way to match the two regimes. Uh, it doesn't matter the detail of how we match it. It's just that we have a scaling law here that was the previous scaling law that is valid for the small beta limit and a power law scaling that we can derive for the high beta limit. And then we just match the two in this particular form. But now you see the black line is this theoretical prediction 
and it seems to fit through all the data pretty nicely and finally captures the fact that as you increase beta, you start dropping um, the diffusivity. The diffusivity starts really dropping compared to the value it had without beta. So you suppress the meridional transport of heat. In the interest of time, we can now play again the game of running solution which are now non-homogeneous where we force the system with the meridional temperature gradient again we use a very large scale meridional temperature forcing so that has scales much larger than the deformation radius so maybe i should have said it before the reason why this closure work is that we are considering cases in the limit where there is a good scale separation between the size of the planet over which you force thermally the system and the size of the eddies um, so now we can run against this system, um, this um, two-layer QG system with a large-scale forcing, but now in the presence of beta. And again, we are going to get a temperature gradient. So these are solutions for beta equals zero was the case that we had before, warm and cold, and you have these vortices meandering around. As we increase beta, still with large-scale forcing, now we start forming some jets. Beta is even larger, you get more and more jets into this system. Uh, with on top of it a large scale temperature gradient. And now we can again solve analytically our problem. So we have the beta equals zero limit predicts the temperature profile as a function of latitude, the zonal average temperature profile that is this blue curve here for a particular value of heat flux. But now if we increase beta, all of a sudden the temperature profile has larger gradients, has larger gradients because we are still applying the same forcing, but now eddies or the turbulence has become less efficient at transporting heat meridionally. So you end up on a planet that has a much larger temperature gradient moving north to south. And if I increase beta even more, well, the temperature gradient increased even further. And again, the dash line as the analytical solution based on our closure, uh, for the closure, it is closure here, and the blue line instead are the result of numerical simulation of the problem, what you see on the left hand side. And again, you're pretty accurate at predicting the profile for different values of beta. So now we have a theory that accounts both for the dependence on drag coefficient on the deformation rate of the shear, but also on this beta parameter and the planetary vorticity gradient, which are the essential parameters that enter in this problem. Uh, maybe we are running out of time. Uh, this is for the aficionados of uh, planetary turbulence. There is an interesting question, which is uh, what is called the criticality. How easy it is to push the system beyond a state that is close to the marginal stability. And uh, it's been argued that you know, in quasi-geostrophic turbulence, you can push the system far beyond the point of marginal criticality. And some people have run numerical simulations of uh, um, primitive equation system, now not a quasi-geostrophic system, and found that it's very hard to push the system at very high nonlinear, in very high nonlinear states. And what we show with our scaling laws is that while it's true that in QG you can push the system um, to super critical value, this is the criticality parameter. One means that the system is close to linear stability analysis and high value of, instead means it's strongly nonlinear. And just to show that, we change the heat flux with which we force the system by close to it's two and a half orders of magnitude. That non criticality parameter changes from something like, I don't know, this might be one and a half to three, four, it has a very weak dependence on the heat flux. So, for atmospheric problems, indeed, you generally consider very small changes in heat flux. You're going to consider changes by some percent. Uh, not orders of magnitude, so it is indeed true that even in QG, the dependence of the criticality is very small on uh, external heat forcing, and we can provide the scaling law for this system. Just that the power to which the critical, the power, the dependence of the criticality on the heat flux has a very low power, and so it's essentially stable, uh, independent of it. And it's a reasonable approximation to assume the criticality doesn't change for typical change of parameters. But the criticality does change as a function of latitude because we are changing beta by a lot and we're just making the point. And indeed, if you look at Jupiter, that's something that has been pointed out. At low latitude, you get this jet um, situation. And this is where you're restricting a lot the temperature heat transport because you have formation of jets in addition to vortices. This is the um, strong beta limit. But then as you go to higher latitudes, all of a sudden your Rhine scale becomes um, 
larger than the intervortex distance. So you have a system instead look much more like a set of vortices. You don't have jets. So indeed, you can get um, low criticality and high criticality as a function of latitude. But the criticality at every latitude is not going to depend much on the heat flux. So if you just change the heat flux, you're not going to have a strong response. And maybe since we're running out of, I did run out of time. Um, I could just leave it at that in the sense people can read the conclusion. I think it's essentially what I said. And we have a scaling law that allows us to predict how the heat transport depends on the ex key external parameter of the system. And uh, we are now, our goal is to try to use the scaling law. We've shown it that we can use it in non-homogeneous system, but still in the two layer QG model, we're trying to expand and now use it in more complex system, uh, particular. Uh, Basil is working with a postdoc in his group on what is called a, a fully primitive equation system. And they tend to find that some of the scaling laws that we derived in particular, the absence of beta seem to hold also in primitive equations of much more complex system that have a very large number of vertical layers and they don't make uh, the quasi geostropic approximation that we made. Uh, if people are interested, I just have two papers um, that we have submitted if people are particularly interested in the second one, I can send it. Uh, it's still under review for AGU advances. And thank you very much. If you have any more questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, thank you very much, Rafael. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much.